redeems and restores mankind, just as you do. Amen. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. 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 All right, so today, I'm a very practical person, you'll find, when it comes to reading scripture. So when you hear seminary, do not get perplexed or concerned, because I, like you, am not too concerned with the fine-tuning of things, because even I am still learning, as we all should be. So, as we dive in today, if you have questions afterwards, I am more than willing to answer them, and I may, in fact, uh, to be perfectly frank, not have all the answers for you, but I definitely invite you to question me and ask and seek, uh, as Christ asked us to do. So, today, uh, I titled the sermon message to be A Walk to Remember. We're going to cover the road to Emmaus, which I find is actually appropriate in the consideration that we just did the Lord's Supper, which I told by Alex we do each Sunday, but I had not planned for that, so that worked in well and tied in well with what I wanted to deliver to you and what I felt the Lord laid on my heart. So, um, with that, let's begin. We're going to be looking at the story of the road to Emmaus, which you may, if you've had any long time in walking with the Lord, you're very familiar with the story of the road to Emmaus, where the disciples are headed to Emmaus from Jerusalem, about seven miles, Luke records. Um, their walk is one of defeat. Uh, and we want to set up that story with this idea that these two apostles of Christ, they followed Jesus during his time on earth, and they had just watched him die a horrible death and listened to his claims of being the Son of God and not quite understanding what that meant in the context of who he was in his life and the promise of him being able to redeem and restore and rebuild the temple in three days, that had all occurred within the span of a few weeks prior. And so what you see in this time is that their walk of defeat is going back. Almost, we could envision it the same way that when we find Peter in another story, that Peter's gone back to fishing. A lot of the disciples have returned to what was familiar with them, what was safe for them after the fact, because Jesus is dead, and it doesn't appear, and they don't remember the fact that he wasn't the fact that he said he was. They forget that. And so with that being said, this walk to Emmaus might just be where you find yourself initially. So let's go ahead and read in Luke 24. Full disclosure, I love the NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible. I do not have a particular slant, so that's, uh, that's just what I'm reading from, so be aware that's the translation, uh, and certainly any of these that uh, we cover today will be in that. So, uh, starting in verse 13 of Luke 24, it says, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were walking with each other about all, they were talking to each other about all the things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, and he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things that have happened to you in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet and mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, in the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had also said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have, that the prophets have spoken. What is it, was it not necessary for, all, for, for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And it continues on, but that's where we'll stop. 
So, with that story, there's a lot to unpack there in a small amount of time, so I'll do my very best. And again, I'm very practical. I like bullet points of three because it allows you to just kind of walk through Scripture. It's a good practice that I engaged in and learned under my father uh, to kind of unpack Scripture in a readable and discernible way for you. So what I want to emphasize is three truths amidst the walking. I don't know if that working to speak if it's not this one. It's an actual walking. Okay, and then go ahead and click again. And you can kind of follow okay. So three truths amidst the walking. <laughs> there are three truths we can unpack in this story, and we'll kind of unpack them in different sections of the story as we go. So the first truth, number one, and if you have a pen, I highly encourage you to uh, fill that in, and you can review this throughout the week for yourself. Jesus meets us where we're at. Jesus meets us where we're at. In Luke 24 and 17, uh, we're going back into the story, and it, it says that Jesus, and this is Jesus speaking, and he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. So you can imagine with me that these two men, uh, we can assume maybe men or women, Cleopas we know, we don't know who the other disciple was that's uh, unnamed, some speculated Simon. it was his wife. Uh, what what was that? Was it Simon? Uh, it has been speculated that it could have been another disciple. Um, we're just not sure what the intention was, but we do know that Cleopas was one of them. And uh, we know that their demeanor, it says they stood still looking sad. So here is Jesus showing up to these disciples on the road. And when he asks them what they're talking about, you can imagine as they're walking, they're having a discussion amongst themselves. And uh, in the translation uh, in the, from the Hebrew, it says that they were having a discussion amongst themselves. So a conversation just like you and I have at a coffee shop um, or any given day of the week about events. And of course, the event of that time was the crucifixion of Christ. And so that was a big event, and all these other events had come before that. And so they're having that discussion, and they're also discussing the fact that Jesus is no longer with them. And it says that they stood still looking sad. And I think it's very important to highlight the fact that he met them in that state. It wasn't that he showed up with this expectation that here I am, I'm Jesus. He met them in the state that they were at, and they were a state of defeat. Uh, my guess, and scholars would guess that, surmise that their walk to Emmaus was one of defeat, one which they were reconciling the fact that they no longer had a leader, someone who had promised to redeem and restore, and instead they were throwing in their losses, as it were, and going home. And if you, like them, have been in a place where you find yourself, maybe even today as you walked in, that you feel defeated, the recognition is that Jesus is wanting to meet you in that time and space. It's not that he's waiting for you to get everything right so then you can meet Jesus all prettied up, but he's willing to meet you right where you're at. We can see in other scriptures that this is true because in Romans 5, 8, we understand as believers that says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, while we were still in our mess, in our grossness, in our depravity, in the things that we were doing all wrong as humanity, Christ came then. He didn't come when we could get it all right and get it all together. In fact, uh, throughout scriptures we see that the Hebrew, that the Israelites, and then into the New Testament, they still continue to fail in that regard. But God, but that Jesus wants to meet us where we are at. It also shows that even in our emotional state, in our in our mental state. The Lord loves to meet us where we're at, because in Psalms 34, 18, and David, as the psalmist, would have more of an understanding of that than I would think anybody else would, says that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The very fact of the matter is, is that Jesus wants to meet you where you are at in the time and place you are at. What that looks like for Kayla and I, in a lot of ways, um, being here is that right now we are currently in the process of looking for a home, which is an exciting prospect, but can also be a little uh, defeating when you walk into a home and you kind of either can't afford it, or it's just not the right time because the seller has a specific timeline. So there are moments where we have in the last few weeks even felt that um, stress or sadness of not getting the home that we felt, but we continue to trust in the fact that Jesus 
meets us where we're at, even in those times. It's not that you just, and I think sometimes our society pushes on us this idea, well, if you're a believer and you have Jesus, you should be happy all the time. You should have a smile on your face all the time as if we're not dealing with life, with difficult relationships, with sickness, and with other items in our life that we don't just walk in and leave at the door when we walk through a church building. Well, yes. if I may make a comment on that, I, yes. I, I strongly believe in my own uh, situation that it is with it, it is if without him I cannot live the life I, that I that I have in front of me. Yeah. Without him, I'm I'm helpless. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yes. There and that is um, the beauty of Jesus meeting these men at where they're at. Because I've, I'm sure in the same regard they felt helpless to the situation they were thrown in. After being promised so long to have a Redeemer who would redeem and restore the people of Israel and then to see him die a criminal death, that would have transfixed them in a place of helplessness. And so for him to meet them and pick their brain, um, it's called situational irony because you remember that the church that started in Acts would have read these same scriptures and then the congregation would have gotten a laugh out of it because they would have known at that time, just like we know now, that that was Jesus that was asking these questions in irony. And yet the people around him were saying, well, you don't know what's going on uh, about himself. So the first truth being that Jesus wants to meet us where we're at. The second truth that I took from this is that Jesus' plan is not your plan. Amen. Jesus' plan is not your plan. Because it also says in Luke 24, 21, you go back into the story, um, after <coughs> a time when Jesus asked what things have been going on, that Cleopas responds, but we were hoping, and you can underline hoping if you, if you want to, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. We were hoping. Their hopes had a certain way of direction. It, it had a certain premise to it. Their understanding and their hope was relying on the fact that Jesus was going to do exactly that, redeem Israel, which had been promised in scriptures by people like Isaiah and the prophets for hundreds of years prior to Jesus' coming. And their hope was aligned with that. So when they watched Jesus die, that criminal's death, all their hope diminished from that situation. It says uh, also in Luke that, to clarify that truth that Jesus' plan is not your plan, it says, and he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart, to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Jesus is telling these disciples, you are being foolish and you are slow in believing exactly what's being already told to you and what's been told to you. And perhaps in this situation you have plans in mind, like Kayla and I looking at a house or other plans in your life, whether that's a relationship gone wrong, whether that's a job that doesn't pan out, whether that's classes that don't line up with your schedule, or a job that doesn't even surface when you need it to surface, or seems like it's not coming up. His plan is not your plan in life. We can see this truth also resonates in Isaiah 55, as Isaiah writes about the future Savior to come. And he discusses this idea, he says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways, declares the Lord. The Lord talking to Isaiah and ultimately talking to the people of Israel about this idea that God is elevated at a point where he understands and foreknows what your life looks like Amen. ahead of you. Amen. And for you to sit there and question that is perfectly legitimate. God doesn't ask us to be silent and just trust him blindly. But he does ask that when we have those temptations and struggles to fall away, the writers of Hebrew encourages the people to push through those times because we can be relying on the fact that God's word is infallible and that God's word is perfect and it has a bend and a twist that we may not see right at this moment, Amen. but we can stand back and look back and see God has been really good. That's the experience that I've had out here in Colorado with Kayla and I. Uh, no more than today when we drove back here, it was reminded of how beautiful this state is. But six months ago, um, we couldn't have told you that's where God was going to have us. We moved out here with uh, the words legacy and adventure in our prayers and in our hearts. There's a, a conversation that my father had started with me a number of months back before that, even in March about. We were in a situation where I was working full-time, traveling uh, for Walmart, and Kayla was working full-time and going to school full-time. 
we saw each other maybe three times out of a month if we were <coughs> um, It was a very difficult life, and it was hard. And I would leave uh, to go off to another project in, in Walmart construction. Uh, and I'd, sometimes I would leave, she can attest to it, sometimes I'd leave just drained and defeated and weeping because I was so tired. And I found myself questioning a lot of the times, is this the plan that you have for me? And why is this the plan that, I, why is this the hand that I'm being dealt? And yet, now, looking back at that time, I have come to realize that this was the plan that God had all along. And there were things that Kayla and I developed in our marriage over that time of long distance that wouldn't have given us the wisdom and the faith and the bravery to step out here to Colorado. Because let me tell you, the Midwest, living expenses are nothing compared to me here in this area, as you well know. If you've lived in Colorado for any time, as we have now a little bit, and more, some of you more so. It's not cheap to live out here, and it's not cheap to live out here with no jobs either. Um, so stepping out in faith and, and trusting that God's plan is not your plan, that Jesus has a plan for you that may not look exactly like you want it to, nice and tidy and neat, is something of high importance for you to remember. It also says in Proverbs that many are the plans in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. In another um, translation it says that the Lord that the man has plan in mind, but the Lord directs his steps. So it's this truth that Jesus and God are looking to direct your steps and again, they may not look exactly like you want, but they, they are the plans that they have in mind, that Jesus has in mind for you. The third truth that we can find in and amidst the walking here is that Jesus has been with you all along. Now we know that Amen. Jesus walks with them on the road this entire time and remember their state of sadness is still there even as he's walking with them. He's still walking with them, and it says in scriptures that their eyes were hidden, uh, uh, he was hidden from their sight. Now, we don't know if that was an intentional or they just didn't recognize him. It doesn't real. there's debate among scholars whether that looks like an intentional item. But regardless, it is the case that they did not recognize him, and yet he walked with them in and amidst their grief, their defeat, all the way to Emmaus. And it's customary in Jewish tradition for you to invite guests, whether you meet them on the road, into a home with you or where you're staying. And so Jesus pretending to go on his way, they were practicing good Jewish tradition of inviting their guests into the home and being hospitable to them. Something to know. But when they sat at the table and partook, just like we partook of the Lord's Supper, it says in Luke 24, 31, after he broke the bread and started passing it out, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. If you are, and I highly encourage you to continue out and read the last part of 24, it talks about how their hearts were burning within the entire time that they were with him. It's almost that situation that you find yourself in when you get into a, into a store or something and you hear a familiar voice and you get this feeling inside that I know that voice. Or maybe when you step into a room where you almost feel like you know nobody, and then suddenly you hear that familiar voice again, and it's someone that you know and your heart is glad. That's the feeling that could be described when it says their hearts were burning within when he spoke. And it says, again, it's not clear on how he revealed himself, but that he revealed himself after the breaking of bread. So after that tradition with the disciples of them, which he had done before, even before his death, he broke the bread for them and then said, this is my body. And we just shared in that communion, they recognized who he was. And I think this is an incredible truth for us to remember because sometimes I think we forget that Jesus is with you in the good and the bad. I think that's a very practical thing that believers can step into in life and then forget about. Yes, Ken. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I, I also do believe that, you know, another thing that, um, you know, it's can at times be easy for even believers to to uh, to not remember or or easy for us to forget is is that you know Jesus overcame death he overcame mm -hmm. the world yes you know so you know as a member of that world you know that's a very powerful Amen. And, and I want to commend you for how you drove that message home that uh, that Jesus, oh, oh, this is an overcoming of the world on the part of Jesus, in my opinion. Amen. Yes. And that's the reality of, of him being with us all along. Because it says in John 1.14, which John writes following that, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we saw his Amen. glory. Amen. Glory as of only the begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John writes these intro, this introduction piece that not only argues for who Christ is and his validity, but also the idea that he was a witness to it, to the glory that Jesus did and to the life that he lived among us. Among us. And then in Hebrews, I think Hebrews is probably one of my favorite books, if I were to pick. Um, but in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, the writer of Hebrews, who we don't know necessarily, I think it's Paul personally. I don't know if you have a preference there, but that's who I think it is. It says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, referring to uh, Hebrews 11, which talked about the hall of faith and all these great prophets and men of God throughout the ages. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every incumbent and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The same Jesus that walked on the road to Emmaus and that walks with us even now and met his disciples where they were at, and the same Jesus that has a plan that is greater than your own, that same Jesus went through similar trials that you went through. Now, he might not have gone through the exact same situation that you find yourself in today, coming into here. We each bear burdens that we come into church with, and sometimes we put on that face and ask, how are you, how are you doing, how was your day? And we nonchalantly say, oh, it's good, but really internally we know it's not. And so my encouragement to you is that you continue to remember these three truths throughout the weekend coming into this new year. Because so many times the mentality is there, this is a new year, but the next day is just the next day. The, that feeling of heightened sense of, I have new opportunities and new growth. I can even get into the gym more. I can get that new job that I want. I can get a new raise. I can try and mend that broken relationship. Or maybe a broken relationship will reach out to me finally. Those things are still occurring the day after New Year's Eve. Those things are still happening in your life. And that's not a fact, that's not, it's not a case that we discount those things. But we do remember that Jesus, who met these two disciples in a situation in their life that they found difficult, continues to meet us. So three considerations I want to write down, and you can take these as your application today, because uh, Alex highly encouraged me to make sure we get some application in uh, for the Word of God, as it is applicable for all things, as they say in Timothy. So number one, the first question we want to ask ourselves is, where am I in my walk? Consider the first truth that we learned uh, through the story of Emmaus. Where am I at in my walk with Christ? Where am I at? Meaning, what does that look like for me in the year 2020? Am I finding myself in a place where I can't trust God fully and wholly? Am I finding myself in a relationship that is difficult or in a family situation that is hard? Am I sick and I'm, I'm not seeing results that I want from the doctor? So we have to assess where we're at because that will allow us to engage with the fact that Jesus is going to meet you there. If we can get into that reality, then we can start to build from there and start to walk with Jesus. <coughs> Jesus invites us to carry our cross from that point. The second consideration I want you to take is, am I making my own plans? Another way you could write that is, am I making my own plans, dot, 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 without God in mind? first. Amen. We have plans for the new year. I have plans. We have plans for house potentially, photography business. We have work plans. Ian can attest to. We have a remodel coming up at the store. These are very practical things. But if they aren't met with the idea that we submit them to God first, then we're missing our second truth, which is Jesus' plan is not your plan. You have to have a plan in mind that all resonates back to who Jesus is. Otherwise, we can accomplish a lot. And you can get the job you want, or you can lead at the church that you want to, or you can do the business that you've always wanted to do, or you can get the grades that you want to get. And all of it will be for naught because you'll look back and say, did I really invite Jesus into that space in my life? Did I really allow him to fully 
teach me and maybe train me and maybe put my feet to the fire and have a few difficult times throughout that and still forget me. And then the third truth, and I think this is the most important truth, do I know Jesus? Because that's where it all starts. See, we make the mistake, I think, a lot of times as believers of thinking that this work at the cross was the ultimate thing. And like Ken pointed out, the ultimate thing is that Christ came back in three days and rose and conquered death and conquered sin. And while the cross is a heavy burden that we should never disparage from and never stop talking about, we have a victory found in Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus. Amen. And so my encouragement to you as you consider those application points in this new year with a lot of new points and a lot of new goals and a lot of new hopes and dreams for your future is do I know Jesus? And we're not talking this idealistic version of Jesus that society likes to paint for us and likes to give us and let us know exactly who Jesus is. We are talking about a down-to-earth Jesus who wore sandals, who walked the dirt roads, who had difficult situations with family, who had difficult situations with the government, who had difficult situations just in general, and then died on the cross for you and me. That is the Jesus that you ought to be knowing and looking to know even more in this new year that comes up. Because if you don't know that Jesus, then what are you doing with this new year? What, is, what looks different for you in this new year that did, than the year before or the year before that? And maybe there's a situation that's been gone, ongoing for years, whether that's health, which we've struggled with, or any other number of things in your life that have been ongoing. And you say, yeah, I know Jesus, and I've known him, but I haven't been seeing the results I want. And I would probably counter to you that perhaps you're missing what Jesus is trying to teach you through a trial and tribulation at this time. Maybe the Jesus that you know has set up in your mind to do this and this for you and is more of a dispensing kind of machine for your needs and your plans rather than a Jesus that looks at you and says, I want you to pick up your cross, I want you to follow me daily, and that implies that we don't get to have a say in how far we carry our cross and how far we go and how long we bear that cross. Because in the end, what that leads to is Calvary. And then after Calvary... We die to whoever we were before, and we walk into the restoration and the perfect person that Jesus desires us to be. It says also in Proverbs or Psalms that the, that the desires of our heart will be met. But it is a stipulation that as you begin to walk with Jesus and get to know him more, your heart transforms into the heart of Jesus. Amen. And when that happens you are able to fully invest in the desires of kingdom mindset rather than earthly mindset. And we are agents in this world, but that does not mean that we are freed from participating in bringing the kingdom here on earth, in our difficult situations, in our sickness, in our families, in our friends, in our workplace, and even in the life of the church. So, with that in mind, remember those three truths. I hope those can apply to you today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer here real quick, and then I'll take any questions you have this time. Father God, we thank you.